It's not a bad. That, that was a pretty good countdown. I like that one. That's a good, good number. Make sure everybody guessed the number. I haven't heard anybody guess yet. That makes guess. me sad. You want me to guess? No, I know. You know it. You gave it to me. Dumb dumb. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Designated Players Podcast. Season 3, episode 14, week 3 in MLS has concluded. There are zero 3-0 and teams left. There are quite a few 0-3 teams. Um, Red Bull are still on pace to be the best team in the league. All is good in the world. How you doing, Sure about that one? Are you, you sure you're on pace to be the best in the league? Best in the league, best in the world. I mean, you can you can phrase it however you like. That's certainly not how I would phrase it, but you know, to each their own. We are going to go back through our weekend or yeah, weekend roundup really. Um, give us our our stock up, our stock down, our player of the week, our worst player of the week, um, best team, worst team, as we usually do, and of course, we're going to revisit Factor Cap with our new name. Hype train or dumpster fire in honor of Mr. Adam Tamborello. Um, he, he uses those phrases a little bit too much, but so are we. No, so not okay. He didn't you know, use it enough. enough. We're not enough. Um, if there's anything you guys want us to talk about, by the way, make sure you leave it in the comments. I'll, you know, week, weekly wrap, uh, wrap ups that we could talk about each and every week, you know, coach, coach of the week, goal of the week, bold prediction from the week. I don't know. Just, just hit us with it. But before we do any of that, we, of course, need to go into Scarf of the Week. I think we probably have pretty similar Scarves of the Week this week. Do we? I mean, you can go first. Well, in honor of their momentous quarter-mile mark for their expected four wins of the season. Let's go! <laughs> Up the FC Cincinnati boys. And you know what? I was so hyped. I brought a second one. Hey, two go. FCC stars. Yeah. So this is so the inaugural uh, the inaugural season one. I bought when it was a dollar on MLS.com. Mm-hmm. This is the one that I got when I went on away days when Red Bull played. FC mm-hmm. Cincinnati. So I got two scars today because I'm cool. nice. Yeah. We could start with our usual stock up, stock down, but that's boring, and we're going to mix things up. So we're going to start with the best player of the week, our star of the week. My So I take notes throughout the week about who I think is probably the best player up to that point. Um, I would like to reference that this is the episode where we slander zero goalkeepers because this was a goalkeeper's week to shine. Um, absolutely unbelievable performances by – Tons of goalkeepers throughout the week. Um, honorable mention to Gaga Slanina with a third clean sheet in as many games. Chicago, the only team to not have conceded. My playoff prediction looking very nice. <laughs> Golden boot looking not so nice. <laughs> uh, mine's just as on pace as yours, so quiet down. That's um, true. Also massive honorable mention to Christian Kalina from Charlotte. The only reason they were as close as they were in that game was because of his phenomenal, phenomenal performance. Um, my star of the week hurt me so badly Sunday night. I have never seen a Red Bull team create. I mean, yes, I have. I watched the Red Bulls in the playoffs. This is like playoffs all the time. They're in playoff form already. They really are. Look at that. Red Bull had a 3.53 expected goals from shots on target reading. 3.53. And Dane St. Clair, my player of the week, kept them all out. He stopped a penalty, poorly taken penalty. I'll, I'll admit that right now, poorly taken. But stopped and held a penalty, kept the year of Omir off of the board from two yards out, rocket from distance. He tips around the post. Dane Sinclair decided to turn into prime Eker Casillas, and nobody stopped him. They were just like, yeah, go on. Have some fun, buddy. When I tell you Red Bull played basically a perfect game on Sunday night, it's not an exaggeration, and it, there's no bias in that. They were very, very good. Drew Yearwood was a machine. Our back five turned back three was locked down basically all night, and it took a wonder goal from Luis Amarillo to beat us. 
Um, I'm not going to sit here and harp about that game because it's over. There's a lot of good to take out of the Red Bull performance, and I will take it because I'm not going to get upset over a loss. But Big Dwayne, my guy, Dwayne, with a W, an absolute monster on Sunday night. Um, I believe he won Player of the Week for MLS as well today, so makes sense. But, yeah, when you when you are able to keep three and a half goals out, you win Player of the Week. So, well done, Dane, Dwayne, St. Clair. Um, we'll be talking about you later in the episode. Is yeah, that I, a shadow? Maybe it is. I, I had a feeling you were going to go with Dane this week, so I, I tried to stay away with him because I do think there are a few other names that should get some recognition in this spot. Um, I will also touch on Dane more later. So spoiler alert, even though it's already been spoiled. I ended up going with Tyus Magno for my star of the week oh, this week. Oh, um, he de- go ahead. Goal and assist this week in a four goal performance for NYC, picking up their first win of the season. They were the NYC was the most dominant uh, attacking team this week. And Tyus Magno was in, if you go watch the highlights from that game, NYC versus Montreal, Tyus Magno was almost in every single highlight relating to NYC, whether they scored or didn't score. Um, He was everywhere for them yesterday. And I know that he still has some things to work on, like his finishing. And I think it will eventually get there. But I think he was so, so good for them this week and, and was really a focal point for their attack. And uh, they, they definitely needed it because Tati was completely off the board that game. No assists, no goals. So Tyus Magdo kind of stepped up into that role and, and made it his own. So I, I, he looked really involved in the attack. And, and if you are going to be that involved in the attack and your team puts up four goals, it's a great look. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm well aware that Tati Castellanos was kept off the board. He was my fantasy striker. So thanks. Yeah, and you, switched, you switched off somebody for him, and I think they got, like, two assists. I forget you who. Did? No, I thought you did. No, I switched him in for uh, Buxa. I yeah, and, and Buxa got two assists. Yeah, I'm, I, I know. I know. <laughs> Fantasy is stupid. I don't like playing this game. I don't know why you keep roping me into it every year, but you do. I, I think ultimately I would have gone Dane as well, but I figured you were going to go with him, so I wanted to. I wanted to just pick somebody else, so – I'm, I'm happy with going with Tyus Magno there. I think he had a really strong week this week. So if you watch the game, Tyus Magno, and I tweeted this out from the podcast account, Tyus Magno is going to be that player that gets a million and four chances this season and has eight goals. His finishing just isn't there. And, you know, this is probably the, the kiss of death, and he's going to score 25, and it's going to be great. But yeah. um, you can tell that he is 18, 19 years old. He's just not as composed as he probably should be in front of net, Um, but he is consistently in the right spot. Um, Yeah. And again, against a very poor Montreal side, but take nothing away from that. You can play against the best team in the world. You can play against the worst team in the world. You got to get in the right spot. He does. So um, not a bad shot. But what I want to know from you is who's your, who's your flop of the week? Who's your worst player of the week? This one was easy for me. This one was easy for me as well. I don't know if we went the same route, but um, I feel pretty justified in mine. I went with Breck Shea because uh, yeah. Breck Shea. Are you going to pick anybody who gets a red card at this point? No, I picked um, I picked Schaffelberg last week. He didn't get a red card. And I picked Khan the first week. He didn't get a red card. <laughs> All right, whatever. <laughs> I, I went with Breck Shea because – he completely lost the mark on the first goal. Poku just danced around and Breck Shea was spinning in circles and then he went on to score. So not a great look to start there. But then your team's already down. You're going into the game in a situation where you are, the, even at home, you are the underdogs. LAFC are just way better, especially on paper, over inner Miami. They're gonna, Miami's going to need a lot of things to go their way if they're going to be LAFC. So what does Breck Shea do? He goes and gets a straight red card in the first half. So that's a uh, that's great. That's that's not going to help the team, especially when they're down. Um, honestly, it was just a really poor performance. The red card and having the goal come from your side of the of the defense. I, I think 
the I, I think Ender Miami needs to realize at this point that Breck Shea is not a defender and it's time to move him either to the bench or up the field because the Breck Shea left back experiment has to be over at this point. And, and one thing I added to my notes is I said, don't be surprised if Inter Miami has a better defensive performance next week. <laughs> um, Noah Allen on the bench was the other option. He is he was a, an emergency signing at the beginning of the year that just signed a full pro contract, which is pretty sick. Um, he's not as he's not any better right now, less because of his inability to play and more of he's still figuring out the pro game. Um, so not a bad shout. I mean, he did get absolutely skinned, but that whole inner Miami back line is disgustingly bad. Um, mine came out of the game that your star came out of and is Victor Wanyama from Montreal. So if you watch that game and you think about what a captain center midfielder does, think about Sean Davis, think about, um, Dax McCarty when he was here. Think about anybody who wears that armband as a as a central midfielder. And think about the energy and the the passion that they give. Then think about the exact opposite of that, and that's what Victor Wanyama gave you. He lacked complete energy, complete desire, and he he lost the ball basically every time he touched it. Anytime the ball broke that midfield line and went into the 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 half space between back line and midfield line. He just stood and watched it. He's like, ah, it's past me, not my job. When he should be falling down and helping double the ball in front of the center backs, right? Um, and then he also gave away very poorly the ball that led to Santiago Rodriguez's chip for the second goal. Again, gives the ball away and just stood there. Uh, and then he didn't even finish the game. He got pulled. So uh, a, a poor day for the uh, former Tottenham Hotspur man. Um, for anybody who wants to know if playing in the Premier League means that you can play in MLS, that's your example. No. <laughs> that, that's a that's a callback to our last episode where they. Oh, is it really? Should people go check that out? I think they should. I think they should. It, it's uh, it actually just released when we were when we were recording this. At the moment. That's right. Did I just shared all the links and Connor still hasn't retweeted them to any of his friends or shared it on Facebook? Yeah, that's right. Well, jokes on you. I don't have any friends to retweet it to. <laughs> Fair. Got me there. Um, while we're there, why don't we talk about players who ro rose their stock this week? Um, I'll give you my first one. I'll give you my honorable mentions first. Spalding from New England, who played in the left back role in the snow game, was okay. I think for somebody who we really haven't heard of, he put in a performance. He didn't raise it as high as the people that I picked. Um, but I thought he did, he had a pretty good game. El Goat, Alec Khan, the rebound from the five goal disaster in week one to be an absolute hero. He makes five saves in a game, but they were massive. Every single one of them was massive, either full extension or tips over the bar, late in game. Can you stop sneezing while I'm trying to talk? Thank you. Um, late in game, big full extensions, massive. Uh, the definition of stock up after week one. And then uh, my, my third honorable mention is Tyus Magno for the same reasons you talked about, except if you're going to have nine shots and only score one goal, you're not my player of the week. I'm sorry. That's why Lewis Morgan and Patrick Kamal were not my player of the week. Tyus Magno still scored one. That's one more than Kamal. And you couldn't have picked Kamal anyway after that penalty. No, I couldn't. Have. I couldn't. Have. But my, my first stock up player Red Bull makes the world takes Derek Etienne Jr. That's and a weird way to say Josie Altidore. Stop. The, an absolute baller Yeah, uh, this weekend. Best player on the field for Columbus by far. Creating chances, scoring goals. Um, the improvement that he's had since he's left Red Bull has been immense. It's been absolutely phenomenal. One goal and one assist against TFC brought his tally to two and two on the year uh, in, three, in three games. So He's on page for the best year of his career attacking-wise. Um, but it's also his play off the ball that I'm really enjoying. Uh, MLS Gone Wild pointed this out, but I noticed it as well. He's coming inside a lot to allow Pedro Santos to play that wing-back role, and he's also combining with Zellerion, freeing him up into space. 
uh, and you know, working with Barry or Zardes, Zellerion, all these attacking players are all kind of combining in the midfield there. Um, fantastic game uh, definition of stock up. Want my second one or you want to go one? I'll go one. So I, I kind of have a joint one here. It's, it's more so focused on one person, but I have a, a joint honorable mention here for uh, Alex Will. Alec Khan slash Brandon Vasquez. <laughs> but it, this is more focused on Alec Khan, even though I think Vasquez had the better game. But I, I think this is the, uh, the Alec Khan redemption arc that we've been waiting for. Redemption I, I, arc. <laughs> yes, because he was my, my week one flop of the week. And now here he is on the stock up portion of the, of the show. So uh, great to see Khan bounce back from that, that week one disaster class. Um, and and just like you had said, he he was phenomenal this game. He he, him and Vasquez single handedly won that game for FCC. I, he made massive saves. He he kept FCC winning, and he kept them in the game throughout. And, and then Vasquez went on to to score the two goals, and they played the game perfectly. Like that that's what you do. Um, when you're the worst team away from home, you play counterattacking. Score like take advantage of your situation of your opportunities and then just kind of lock it down from there. And Alicon was a big reason as to why they were able to successfully lock it down. And I will gladly put anybody on here who stops Orlando from getting three points. So you know why I have two scars, really? It's because two FCC players stock up. It's because Brandon Vasquez had two goals and he's on my stock up. Up. FCC straight to the moon, like, like here's FCC right about here, uh-huh. right, and here's the moon, and they are going right there, straight to it, straight to it, straight to the moon. Um, Vasquez was really good at getting into scoring positions in this game. Um, he was able to turn two of them away, of course, but the amount of shots that he was just getting off and chances towards goal and forcing Gaiese into, you know, covering the post or making saves in general is something that we haven't seen out of a FCC striker in a long time. Um, FCC got their first win in 15 games yesterday. 15 games. And there are zero ties in there, by the way. That is 14 oh. straight losses. Yikes. So this is absolutely <laughs> massive for this team. Uh, good for Pat Noonan on getting his first career win. Um, but it, again, if you watch off the ball movement, really great, getting tons of good chances. And really he should have had a third. He had a breakaway that guy has made a bad decision to come out on and he put the ball wide of the post, but still got the three points, still got the win. Uh, Brandon Vasquez taking FCC where straight to the moon, <laughs> right to the moon. I'm, I'm also happy to see that you kept the NYC banner up there. Uh, oh, of course. It's a good touch. I mean- once the Yankees start playing, I'll cover it up like it'll happen in real life. But mm-hmm. for now, I'll leave it there. I like it. It's a nice touch. <laughs> All right. So my my play, my other stock up player, it's going to be a quick one as well here. Uh, it's it's Dane Sinclair. We touched on it before. Massive, Why? massive week this week. What? Why are you picking the players who stock is already high? What, Dane's? Dwayne, yes, his stock is ridiculously through the roof. His stock is not – he didn't even start a game all season. Oh, we're, we're going to talk about it. Don't you worry. I said at the beginning of the season that the one-two punch at Minnesota was arguably the best goalkeeper one-two punch in the league. Probably is. I, I don't even know if it's an argument, to be honest. It, it is so criminal in this league that Dane St. Clair is on the bench and, and is the number two. I mean, he may not be after that last game, but – it is so criminal that he is the number two. I personally think that he's even better than Tyler Miller, but I i mean, it's just wild to me that this, that, that this guy is not starting games for someone else. Like, I don't know what more he needs to do to show a team that they need to come grab him and bring him in. Like, what more do you need to see? He was, he was great when he got his chances originally when he first built up his, his stock. And now he he jumps in here after after a pretty long run from Tyler Miller, and he immediately was like, he immediately took his chance, and it was phenomenal. I I can't I, I can't figure out what more he needs to do in order to get a starting job somewhere. I, I think 
someone I, I think I heard rumored that New England looked into Dane, which I think would be a good landing spot for him, especially with Matt Turner going out. Um, but that's too much talent for Bruce Arena, so he probably won't do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Instead, he'll probably settle for Nick Romando out of retirement. Hope but yeah. um, speaking of New England Revolution, sorry, I don't know. Are you done? No, nah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, not much more to add. According to multiple rumors, Matt Turner suffered second degree oh, yeah. frostbite of his kicking foot during the World Cup game versus Honduras, which yeah, is why Bruce Arena and U.S. Soccer have not said anything about why he's been hurt. That's unbelievable. Yeah, who would have thought people will get frostbite playing in like negative 15 degrees? And people still want to move to the European calendar. It's, I just, hate people. it's just wild. I hate people. Um, stock down. I want to know your first stock down. Oh, give me two. I just want to know one. All right. Well, I, I had Breck Shea on there for one of them. So I, I kind of covered it already. Um, Wait, you put uh, Breck Shea as your stock down and your worst player of the week? Yeah, it's what I've done every week. Lazy. <laughs> Lazy. I will start with Joel Waterman um, out of Montreal. A lot of times he was left cleaning up mistakes in front of the players or, or for the players in front of him or the players next to him. Um, so he didn't have as bad of a game as it looked, but he did also give away the ball that caused the fourth goal. And the reason why he's on my stock down is a player – who is playing in a game that has already conceded three goals, most of which, I think two of the three of which, came from trying to play out of the back and failing. Conceding a goal like that, where you literally give the ball away as they're pressing you and you're trying to play out of the back for a fourth time, you're just not learning. You're just not reading the game and learning. So um, his stock dropped for me a little bit this game. I just I was expecting somebody on Montreal to step up and be a – strong defender and i know they rotated i know they rotated for ccl whatever but that's just not good well i'll keep this one pretty quick my my other stock down was joe waterman believe it or not yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah I don't, I don't have a ton more to add i would i will say that i i think you will always get a grain of salt when you have to go play in the baseball stadium it's sure. never easy um but I do think I agree. He had a, a pretty rough game, especially giving away the fourth goal. Uh, Montreal just looked awful playing it out of the back. Like their the composure was just absolutely not there. And uh, his giveaway for the fourth goal kind of just put the cherry on top of it all. And I don't expect him to be putting in performances like this throughout the season. Like this isn't the quality of Joel Waterman. He's not, of course, the best center back in the league. But I would fully expect better performances from him moving forward but it was just an off week and unfortunately it was uh an off week enough that he he would land the stock down for both of us nice very good um i'm about to have a field day on this one i gotta stretch <laughs> oh boy patrick Kamala? a second stock down can you guess it's a good one can i get a team no, I will give you Western Conference. The team is too easy. Western Conference. Probably Jackson Yule. Jackson Yule at center back experiment needs to stop. I'm tired of it. Jackson Yule at center back is a straight up liability. This man is not a defender. He's just not. I get the idea, right? Play five in the back with a center defensive mid. Just pray the ball and, and work your whatever. It's not working, man. It, looking at the numbers, right? We're nerds. We like numbers. He tried to make four tackles that game. He got beat twice. That's 50% success rate. And he only made two interceptions that entire game and gave away four fouls as a central center back. That means they were just penetrating the entire time and he had nothing to do except foul them. And only won one aerial duel because he's five foot ten. Anyways, he also got caught in possession, right? He tries to dribble out from the back and play out. Somebody pressures him from behind and loses the ball, whatever. The experiment needs to stop. And there's only one reason. Because if it doesn't stop soon, 
a certain bald U.S. men national team manager is going to take notice. And then Aaron Long's going to be sitting on the bench while Jackson Ewell single-handedly keeps us out of Qatar. Are you <laughs> trying to tell me? For it. Are you trying to tell me right now that you don't want to see Jackson Ewell at the Azteca? <laughs> I want Jackson Ewell, like, in Maine, as physically far away in the United States as you can be from Estadio Azteca. I don't want him anywhere near it. And if he gets anywhere close to it, steal his cleats. You can't play without cleats, steal them. Oh, he'll try. Don't you you gotta do more than just steal the cleats. You're gonna have it's to just, like it's just it's painful to watch. Like he you can see that there is supposed to be something happening, right? He carries the ball out. Somebody isn't checking into the right space for him. That it's it's not working. But his decision of how long do I hold the ball before I lose it, get tackled, and then it's four on two going the other way, it's just not working. Go back to your, your double pivot, put Judson in the middle with him and, and fix it. But it's just not working. Almeida is physically trying to bring this team straight to the ground before he leaves. He's doing everything oh, in his yeah. power. He does not care at all. Not he's just he's bit. fully experimenting like with the wildest things just because he can. Also, he's JT like, Marzinkowski was not brilliant in that game either, but team of the week. Team of the week. I went with NYCFC. Ah, you're boring. You're so boring. <laughs> they 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 scored the most a... goals. Yes, they did. They did score the most goals. So boring. They were all. They also did it coming off of a, a midweek CCL game. So Ooh, I, I Montreal. You know they don't. You know what are you? What are they supposed to do? They got to show up against the bad opponents. We gave the same credit to Austin last week when they beat Inter Miami. How are how are we talking about a team when the biggest part of that game is not even the team performance? It's this this tiny ass sign is the only thing people are talking about from that game. Nobody can name anybody who scored goals in that game. Can you? If you can name all four goal scorers right now, I'll be impressed. It was. Cayenne, Santiago Rodriguez, Tyus Magno, and hold on. Exactly. exactly. No, no, no. I could get it. I could. It was exactly. the fourth It's score. taking you that long because the only thing you can think of right now is that poster board size of a banner sitting up in the top third tier deck of Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Oh, they, they earned this. They look, They were very good going forward. They Daniel. looked like a really strong attacking team. And that was without Tati Castellanos really getting involved. So I can only imagine if Tati gets more involved in this attack, it's going to be super difficult to defend. And we already know that they are solid defensively. They're not, you know, great. They're not the best in the league. But, you know, Kynes is always going to be a rock in the back line. Shaw Johnson is fantastic between the goalposts. And then you have Chano, Amundsen, and whether it's Tavon Gray or, or Tinner Holm comes back, like the back line is going to be solid. So I think it's a strong team. And once CCL is done, I think you're going to see more performances along this line. So I, I think it was a good week for them. It's, it's a, a week that they needed because they haven't gotten a win so far in the league. And uh, they look strong. They look good. They look all right on a baseball stadium against the worst team in the East. Just relax. Mine. Oh, I hit the board. Darn it. Mine comes out of the Western Conference. And it's a team that you never would expect me to talk about. FC Dallas. FC Dallas. Bit out there, but they absolutely handled Nashville last week or this weekend. Um, they were at home, but they used that to their advantage. They were 13 to 5 in shots for. 57% of the possession, and they played very well on the counterattack when Nashville did have the ball. Uh, Ariola got into very good spaces all throughout the game and drew a lot of defenders out of position, which was able to create chances for them, which was very good. Um, Alan Velasco made his debut and made a messy esque run to score the second goal of the game. Um, massive attacking difference. This dude is going to be an absolute baller. I can't wait to watch him and Ariola side by side. They're going to be dirty. Um, Nashville had to make 17 interceptions this game, and most of them were in and around their own area, which tells me that they had the ball in dangerous spots and they were trying to play penetrating passes. If you look at where FC Dallas is, I think they had nine interceptions. They were mostly at the middle of the park, um, which means that Nashville wasn't able to work the ball as close to uh, Dallas's goal as Dallas was to Nashville. 
Um, again, playing on the front foot most of the game, uh, very, very impressive. Uh, the penalty, I think, was a little weak. I'm not going not gonna to lie there, but you take them as you get them, right? Um, they didn't score the most goals or win by the biggest margins, but for Nico Estevez and FC Dallas, this is a phenomenal win. My team of the week for the game plan and uh, for the opponent that they beat. That's fair enough. It's a good winning I'm, over now. I'm guessing your worst team is going to be Montreal. No. No, I told you already what my worst team was going to be. Well, mine is so good. Um, <laughs> Montreal have did not do their homework before the game. They did not realize you can't play out of the back on the baseball field. Two giveaways leading to goals, lack of desire, lack of heart, lack of passion from anybody except Jordy Mihailovic. I know they rotated to play in CCL. I get it. I'm ready for Montreal fans to cut me in half, and I get it. But this, I mean, even for your backups, this is an embarrassing performance. Coaches in general, not just Wilfred Nancy, but coaches in general need to stop thinking that they can outplay the field that they're on. You can't build out of the back playing on the baseball field. It's got to be ugly soccer. It's got to be dump it high, press it high, and see what you can do with it. But you're not going to be able to play out of the back because there's just not enough space to do it. Has to be ugly, but it's going to give you your best results. They didn't do Montreal didn't do their homework beforehand. They didn't learn throughout the game. They continued a poor game plan throughout the game without making any adjustments except for bringing on the best player in the league, Jordan Mihailovic. And it was just embarrassing watching that entire game. So Montreal is my worst team of the week. Wabam. I'm going to pretend like you didn't just say wabam. Wabam. All right, I've been waiting for this one ever since the result won final. I, I'm so excited for this one. And it's totally not even justified because they were certainly not the worst team of the week. But when you lose at home with arguably one of your start, your strongest starting lineups, when you lose at home to FC Cincinnati, you are automatically my flop team of the week. Sorry, I don't write the rules. That's just how they are. Orlando City, oh, this makes me so happy to put you here. And and feel free to clip this when Atlanta inevitably does the same thing later in the year. Oh, you know I will. Yeah, and, and just send it right back to me because, you know, it's totally justified. But Yeah, you have to take it when you can. Listen, I get it. Yeah, yeah. For now, I'm going to be dunking all over Orlando because as a rival, I am morally obligated to do so. Um, I don't know how you put together – a full starting 11, Pato, Pereira, Facundo Torres. They had um, Antonio Carlos, Gallese, Junior or so. Cara was and in you, there. And you, yeah, Cara. And you lost to FCC, who were missing Brunner, Mazzarita. They were missing Ray Gaddis. And you lost to them at home. <laughs> no, stop. I am not letting you put Ray Gaddis in a list of players that hurt. I am going to put Ray Gaddis because you know who his replacement is? Alvis Powell. <laughs> that is not an upgrade. You can't tell me that. That is that is so, so bad. I, and I, I looked at the numbers. Obviously, the numbers were strong for Orlando. They were probably the better team, but SEC played the better style. They, they did the job correctly. But, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dunk all over Orlando because you lost to the worst team in the league at home with your, with your full starting 11. So, yeah, you, you absolutely deserve to be in this spot in my mind. The absolute disrespect by calling FCC the worst team in the league. Have you seen I the did. standings? Have you seen the standings? <laughs> Quiet down. Quiet down. Don't disrespect my boys. The, the only reason the standings look the way they do is because Orlando gifted them that. <laughs> Stop it. They didn't gift it. They earned it. FCC earned I it. Did, I did put it in my notes that FCC definitely um, credit where it was due. FCC played their game really well and, and got the points that I feel like they deserved. But Are you still. done with this slander? Yes. It's not slander, but it's... It's absolute slander. It's a little bit slander, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's for fun. <laughs> I'm calling a lawyer to put you on for libel. That's a thing, right? <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Neither of us are lawyers. I don't do law. I'm a nerd. Just keep throwing out lawyer terms. It is some sound fancy. <laughs> some will say. If I use enough legalese, it'll make me sound intelligent enough. Gross negligence. <laughs> counter lawsuit. Appeal. 
Um, all right, let's move into Factor Cap, now newly named Hype Trainer Dumpster Fire. Um, I will give you mine, then you can give me yours. Okay. Dane St. Clair, I told you we were coming back to him. Dane St. Clair right now is worth at least $100 million in some sort of allocation money to a team that needs it. $100 million? I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> $1 million. $1 million, not $100 million. I thought you were just doing it for, for a meme. No, no, one mil, one million in some combination of allocation money to a team in MLS who needs him right now, um, who has goalkeeper issues. Dumpster fire. No, I don't, I don't think he's worth a million. Oh, I, Ma- Maxime Paul Propeller went for two. What? Paul Ariola went for two. Lewis. Moore okay, but you you can't compare two. it to an out an outfield player. You got to compare it to another goalkeeper. Maxime Cropo went for one million, and he was starting every game for Vancouver. Dane, as great as he is, barely got game time last season. It's a great yeah, performance. Because he got hurt and then Tyler Miller took over. Tyler Miller's out. I guarantee you Dane Sinclair stays in there. That's how it works in Minnesota. They have a rotation. That's how it works every time. One of them gets hurt. The other one comes in, keeps a job until the other one, until they get hurt again. I, I don't think he's worth – I think he has the potential to reach the $1 million price mark, but I don't think he's there right now just because he hasn't had the game time as of recent. Give me a stretch of like 10 games with him and he keeps performing as well as we know he can. Yeah, I would say hype dream. But as of right now, no. All right, here are teams that I absolutely think could take him right now. For a million. million. Revolution. For a million. For a million. In in, in Tam Gam, a million. Because that stuff expires and uh, I will give you that. that. That doesn't mean that they just have it sitting around. Yeah, they do. How do you know? You see their fine headses? Yeah. Matt Turner, or I'm sorry, New England Revs, Matt Turner gone. Yeah. Sporting Kansas City. Tim Millia has not been performing at the level we expected him to. <laughs> I think you you do a, a gammon, gammon player swap. I think he makes Portland infinitely better. Well, I wouldn't do it. I would say Colorado, but you know they're not moving on from William Yarbrough. <laughs> Toronto FC, absolutely. Whoa, your audio got really scuffed there for a second. Uh, did it really? Do you <laughs> yeah. hear me now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Toronto, yeah, Toronto FC, absolutely. You're telling me Dane St. Clair doesn't walk into that Toronto FC team and make them oh, at yeah. least minimally better? Absolutely. San Jose? I mean, I, I rate him over JT Marcinkowski. Um, Montreal. Brez is on a loan. If he doesn't go permanent, I'd take him too. Inter Miami. Yeah. And then that's, I mean, right there, that's six, seven teams. Yeah, most of which wouldn't or couldn't spend the one million on Dane St. Clair. Give me a side eye. I think that's I think that's bad. No, there are seven teams that I would, if I were them, I would drop a million right now, knowing that there is an increase coming up every year for the next four years. Drop a million, go get your goalkeeper for the next seven years, or go drop a million in GAM and then sell him for actual money later on and not have to worry about another thing. I think, I think Tam GAM has way more use uses than you would think they would, because I feel like the, the mindset you're thinking of is all the Tam GAM is going into buying players. But I think there's a lot more of the Tam GAM that gets spent on other areas as opposed to just buying players. Cause I get what you're saying and that it'll just expire if you don't use it. But I think they I think there's a lot of teams that use it to either like buy down contracts or or do other like smaller moves or smaller transactions with the with the Tam Gam. And I, I just don't think there's a million sitting around for a team that is looking to buy Dane. What what do you what is Sporting Kansas City gonna do with a million dollars in GAM right now? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't. I don't have the behind the scenes, so I, I can't say for sure. They're not buying down any of their their designated players. So, 
I don't I'm throwing that at Dane St. Clair and saying, Tim Milia, go on the other way. Because Tim Milia will be a fine competition for Tyler Miller. And if Tyler Miller can't go, Tim Milia can step in. But I'm going Dane St. Clair every day of the week. I think you I, are out I of don't mind. think someone pays a million for him right now. I think you're out of your mind. I, I don't. I can, I can go find an equivalent for someone who's played as often as Dane. And I guarantee you, you would not say that they should spend a million to buy him. Yeah. Give me yours. I can't, I can't deal with you right now. You are giving me headaches. My statement is FCC will not finish bottom of the Eastern Conference. I told you this is a hype train. I did this two weeks ago. This is absolute hype train. These guys are going to be to the moon. We just, we just we drew it on the board. The moon. I did not. I said, here's what I said. I said, if they play the way that they did last game, hype train. If they play the way that I expect them to play, dumpster fire. Because this mm. roster is not good enough to do anything significant, even if they have everything clicking on all cylinders. Because this roster is, is awful. And I won't, I'm not going to sit here and listen. I think, I think the potential is there for them to beat out a Montreal, Charlotte, Miami. But I think the jury is still out. It's still too early to say that they will. So my final answer is dumpster fire. I still think. How think dare you wear the scarf of this team and slander them to the level that you have? How dare you, sir? You should be ashamed and you should I'm be not, banned I'm from not ashamed. Ever wearing such a thing ever again. FCC always is strong at the start of the season. And How do you? Out. Yes, but that's the whole point. You buy, we're Mets fans. We know this. You <laughs> buy into the hype. You believe in the hype. You have your heart broken. You get to the end of the season, you do it again. No, you can't. If you are an FCC fan, you can absolutely not give yourself hype going into the season. What is there to be no, hyped about? What else do you have to do as an FC Cincinnati fan except get hyped after your first win in 15 games? The only thing you could be hyped about is like focusing on one player. Like maybe you're hyped if you see Brunner go and, and play well. Like that's the best Why you can do. about Brunner who hasn't seen the field in three weeks? Give me Brandon Vasquez to Golden Boot talk. That's what I'm talking about. Are, so are, are you saying Brandon Vasquez is going to beat out Lewis Morgan for Golden Boot? Is that what I you're talking I think Brandon me? Vasquez has a better shot than Christian Arango does. He's got a better shot than Casper Shabilko does. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Casper Shabilko is doing really good being the tallest player on the team and then drifting out wide when the cross is getting ready to come in <laughs> instead of being in the box to head it in. It's really great. I love it's, it. I love it's watching. 500 IQ plays. He, he's... The defense is going to think he's going in the middle, but when he rolls out to the wing, they're all they're all messed up. And that's when Fabian Herbers comes in and wins it for them. And then we hear about it on the podcast afterwards. I want to listen to that episode. They played each other this week. Yeah, it's going to be a good episode after that. I can't wait. Um, I'm not I'm not going to let you slander FCC. So this is where we're going to end it. Um, thank you everybody for listening or watching, depending on where you're at. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you leave a comment letting us know what you think letting us know what other stuff we should add to our weekly recap list. Um, any hype train or dumpster fire thoughts that you might have, you want to add to the list, let us know. Um, make sure you, you absolutely come for Connor in the comments for being the most disrespectful FCC scarf wearing individual in the world. Um, make sure you absolutely just slander him in the comments at the level that he slandered FCC. Um, make sure you're following us on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. We are super active these first couple of weeks. And we're going to hope to keep it that way. Um, follow us wherever you get podcasts, you know, when we go live um, and get ready for our next live stream. The one that Connor is definitely not going to bow out of this time. It's in the calendar. <laughs> it, it's not in the calendar. I don't know it exists. I hate you. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm done. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on the next episode of the Designated Players Podcast. See ya.